from the possible introduction of the fast track legislation to the return of the three strikes law. The Waitangi Tribunal and its Oranga Tamariki hearing impacted by the High Court in its decision regarding the appearance of Minister Karen Shaw. And of course the public sector cuts and the latest political poll released Tonight, it's all on in Te Aotearoa here in Aotearoa. To unpack all of that, I'm joined by our esteemed panel, the erudite, educated and entertaining Ahorangi Professor Dr Ella Henry from the Auckland University of Technology at Te Aotearoa Tēnākoe. Also joining us is Associate Professor in Politics, Lara Greaves from Te Heringawaka Victoria University, Tēnākoe. And also joining us for the first time, political commentator DC Harding. DC, no mai ahoa. Welcome. Good to have you here. E ako rangatira, tēnākoe katoa. Let's get into it. We'll start with the poll. I'm calling it the Mikey Sherman poll uh, that was released tonight at 6 p.m. Massive change here. After six months, the poll says Nats 36%, Labour 30%, Greens 14%. Wow, that's an increase. Act down two to seven. New Zealand first gone under the 5% threshold at four. Te Party Māori its highest at 4%. What do you think? <laughs> the people have spoken and, and obviously we can, we hope, trust these polls because they were very accurate at the election. So uh, accuracy is as accuracy does. The people have spoken. Lara Greaves? Yeah, fundamentally, one of the... So Professor Stephen Levine has a post-election conference every election and one of the pollsters came and talked and said, you know, New Zealanders voted for change but said this might not be the kind of change they voted for and that's kind of stuck with me this whole time that perhaps the change that we've had, the change that we've got, isn't quite what the change that Kiwis wanted. OK, I look uh, forward to delving deeper into <laughs> that and after this. DC? Yeah, I'm not surprised either. I think what we've seen is a galvanisation of, of rhetoric hitting the, the, the airways and I think that's impacted uh, the, the general people at home. I was just in Christchurch recently and people were talking about it on the tramway about how uh, how they believe that our government has underperformed. So I'm not, I'm not surprised at all. OK, uh, DC says underperformed. But where particularly, Ahorangi, do you think they have underperformed in six months to be here now? Well, obviously, many Māori have been concerned for quite some time about the direction many of these policies have taken. But I think it would be very few households in the country that do not know someone who's losing their job mm. or about to lose their job. Mm. And, and that, I think, is when the rubber hits the road. Mm. When you think, hey, we were promised so much more and my aunt is about to lose her job mm. or my cousin is about to lose his business. Somehow the rhetoric doesn't meet the outcomes. And I think at that point you have these kinds of clashes. The rhetoric you're talking about, is this the harsh rhetoric, you know, we hear Shane Jones saying things like make Aotearoa, make New Zealand great again, Winston Peters uh, mentioned, you know, Nazi Germany <laughs> in a speech and things like that. Is that the harsh rhetoric that you're talking about when people are doing it tough and I think so. I think when, when we're being told these, these particular images about what's happening, uh, you know, and this is all going to make Aotearoa New Zealand more... Oh, sorry, stop calling it Aotearoa. And it's going to make New Zealand more <laughs> more productive. And, you know, the foundations of productivity are innovation. How can you be innovative if you don't know if you're going to have a job in three months? Mm. Um, I mean, I think those tensions are starting to bubble up. Mm. Associate Professor, you talked about that this is not the change that people were expecting. Yeah. Are you talking about things like introduction of things that we didn't know were going to be on the agenda when we went to an election, like smoking legislation and other things? Or is it something else you meant by I that? think it is a bit of that, and is a bit of the like the kind of peeling back of what Labour had done, which some of it was in different platforms, some of it wasn't. But the fundamental thing, and I think it, I always come back to this, there was a Herald poll like last year talking about, hey, are New Zealanders more divided? And the majority of people said, yes, they're more divided. And I think what they assumed and what everyone assumed, oh, we're more divided across COVID and truth and misinformation, but it was actually economics. We were most divided over economics. And in those conditions, populism and the kind of rhetoric that Winston Peters and Shane Jones engage in thrives. So that's where, where we've seen internationally austerity and inequality is where populism thrives. And we've had our own version of populism this last election, but fundamentally, the economic indicators for people aren't getting better. And, like, fundamentally, you know, I've just come back from Australia. 
wow, you know, like there are so many other places that can give people economically a better life. Yeah. And that's that's where the rubber is going to hit the road, is like economically is New Zealand going to get better? And that's, we're yet to see anything like that, are we? So, so you're talking about petrol prices, food petrol prices? Petrol prices, food prices, interest rates, if you've even got a mm. mortgage. <laughs> but all of that, impossible, impossible yeah. here now. DC, will the Prime Minister be worried here? Because it's not just New Zealand First that's taken a hit in these polls. National's down, his own preferred Prime Minister poll is down. Act's down another 2%. Actually, Act is been declining through the polls since the election itself. He'll be worried, won't he? I'm not sure that he will be. I, I don't think he, he puts his his fate in in these polls, and we've seen it through the discussions that he's, he's had over the last couple of, of years. You know, polls go up and go, come down, as, as he says, and, um, you know, he's looking for outcomes. So at the end of the day, he, he wants to be judged based on those outcomes, and so he'll give it another six months, 18 months, to see where he lands. Yeah. The other interesting thing, and we talked about economics, but the other interesting thing is we've seen what we we would normally see as some policy by third-term governments, uh, things like, you know, what people call nanny state policies, you know, no cell phones in schools, being introduced by a first-term government here. This is the first first-term government, I think, in a long time that has dropped this low in the first or second poll since an, an election. Do you think that's it, or is there something else going on here, holding? I mean, I think that's part of a package of things that are going on. The big hit stuff, the loss of jobs, the increase of food, uh, the petrol hikes, those, those are the big ticket items. And then we're also being, I suppose, confronted with little things like you can't take your... which most of us don't really care about, unless, of course, you're a child in a rural area mm. that needs a phone to be able to tell mum or dad that the bus is not working tonight yeah. and you have to come and pick me up, you know. I mean, there are a lot of reasons why we, kids have phones at school now. OK. The, the other interesting thing I wanted to raise was Māori Party again in a kingmaker position. Uh, you know, up to 4%. That's high for the Māori Party, particularly in a poll like this, this soon after Yeah, we've seen election. that in the polls, actually. We've yeah. seen the Party Māori do quite well on the party vote in the polls and then not quite get there, like, say, on election day before, whether that's a strategic vote. You think, yeah. I mean, you were right, you were right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, the one, the one um, Māori commentator that was right. But, you know, fundamentally it is, it's like, I think that people will... If, if they're being turned away from this, turned off by this government and this package, they will kind of move more towards Te Pāti Māori and the opposition. Again, though, we are like a couple of years out from yeah. election. There's all these scenarios where the government could fall apart and then fundamentally, if we went back to another election, this could happen, that could happen. You know, Andrew Geddes will get called up and talk about the Constitution, I'll get called up and talk about the polls and it'll be a whole bunch of drama. But I don't see that also happening, like... Even though some people, I think, on the left are wishfully thinking the government will fall apart. We don't have that indication yet. Yeah. So we're still years away from anything no, no, happening. No, you're right, you're right. So we, we need to be careful we're not reading however, too much However, Greens at 14% is very high, mm -hmm. right? And which says a few things as well. Um, let's go to Seven de Belay and the Waitangi Tribunal. And um, I want to get your view on this, um, DC. Mm -hmm. um, so the Waitangi Tribunal released its interim report today. It is a scathing report. It says the, the removal of 7 AA will cause... Uh, harm. Tracy Martin, the former minister, who's died in blue, you know, New Zealand first minister, repealing 7AA will leave kids worse off. What's your response to the Waitangi Tribunal's report? Oh, look, they're 100% right. We know that, that Waka Papa is important to our people, and when you remove that sort of um, space from legislation and, and with, with the intent of saying that, that um, the, the physical safety of a child is more important than the holistic safety. It just shows where this government is, is going wrong. And the other point that I would like to say about this is that this shows that there is actually no innovation to fix a problem. The idea to remove something from a piece of legislation, which is going to cost lots of money, instead of fixing the actual problem, which is a couple of social workers misinterpreted a piece of legislation, so let's fix that. Let's put in some training and development around that, but instead what they're going to do is they're going to strip our kids from their waka papa again. Okay. What should the minister do, Professor? Should the minister just front up and knit this in the bud? We've got a court of appeal hearing happening on Wednesday and Thursday this week. I, I, I'm, I'm saddened that the response from the minister was to hunker down uh, and, and take an advice that flew in the face of, of many other legal opinions. I mean, if she really wanted to exercise mana... I think that she could stand up and say, I took the advice from my ministry and we believe this is going to work because... I mean, try to convince us, uh, as a population who've been battered by changes to child, youth and family ministries for 30 years, mm. try to convince us. And I think that would do a wonderful thing of redeeming her and her party. Do you think that's going to happen, though? 
Nope. Mm -hmm. mm. Let, let's talk also, and I, I want to carry this on, and we're coming to a break soon, but, but the view of the Waitangi, or, or the perspective internationally of the Waitangi mm. Tribunal. We're coming up to 50 years almost next year of the Waitangi Tribunal and its evolution in 1975. Um, Lara Greaves, what is the perspective of the international community to the Waitangi Tribunal? Well, fundamentally, what we're seeing is so many different states, including, you know, all the kind of previous British colonised states, looking looking to New Zealand, looking to Aotearoa to see what we've done, of course, as a case study, but also looking to resolve or, to, or come to some kind of level of resolve of past grievances, past injustices, current injustices, current grievances within their societies. And so the Waitangi Tribunal has been one way to start to look at addressing mm. those. And so fundamentally, we are a bit of like a, I don't know, not necessarily a leading light, but a, a case study, an example there. And that's where it's really interesting to see where the Waitangi Tribunal is going to go in the future and what kind of role that it would have and what kind of role that, like, this kind of... And, and, and whether we do end up with some kind of constitutional transformation long term where we do have some kind of Māori accountability on the Crown mm. is a really interesting question that, you know, I know Shane Jones is going for a review, but it's actually a really interesting question, say, 50, another 50 years down the line where that goes. What should the role of the Waitangi Tribunal be, DC? Um, I think moving into kaupapa claims is the right place to go. I think there's lots of areas that, that we as Māori need to have answered, you know, particularly around tikanga and employment. I think that's a huge area for, for our, our people um, though it showed up in, 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 some, in some cases um, in the past, I think the Waitangi Tribunal needs to be there to hold our government to account because we've still got um, some settlements to go and as we were talking about earlier, these aren't going to be full and final and our, our young whanau are going to come back and start questioning around why things were, uh, had happened that way and where do they go if, if, the White, if the Waitangi Tribunal is not there to the government? Yeah. Oh, hold on, I know you want to jump in. I'm going to go to a quick air break and then I'll come back to you. We'll also talk uh, after this. We'll talk fast track legislation as well and more with our panel after this.